Genesis chapter number 18, verse number 20 is where we're going to begin. We'll read Genesis 18, verse 20, all the way down through verse number 33, the end of the chapter. But Genesis chapter 18, verse number 20. Genesis 18, 20 says this, And the Lord said, because the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and because their sin is very grievous, I will go down now and see whether they have done altogether according to the cry of it, which is come unto me, and if not, I will know. And the men turned their faces from thence and went toward Sodom, but Abraham stood yet before the Lord. And Abraham drew near and said, Wilt thou also destroy the righteous with the wicked? Peradventure there be fifty righteous within the city. Wilt thou also destroy and not spare the place for the fifty righteous that are therein? That be far from thee to do after this manner, to slay the righteous with the wicked, and that the righteous should be as the wicked. That be far from thee. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? And the Lord said, If I find in Sodom fifty righteous within the city, then I will spare all the place for their sakes. And Abraham answered and said, Behold now, I have taken upon me to speak unto the Lord, which am but dust and ashes. Peradventure there shall lack five of the fifty righteous. Wilt thou destroy all the city for lack of five? And he said, If I find there forty and five, I will not destroy it. And he spake unto him yet again and said, Peradventure there be forty found there. And he said, I will not do it for forty's sake. And he said unto him, O oh, let not the Lord be angry, and I will speak. Peradventure shall thirty be found there. And he said, I will not do it, if I find thirty there. And he said, Behold now I have taken upon me to speak unto the Lord. Peradventure there shall be twenty found there. And he said, I will not destroy it for twenty's sake. And he said, O oh, let not the Lord be angry, and I will speak yet but this once, peradventure ten shall be found there. And he said, I will not destroy it for ten's sake. And the Lord went his way as soon as he had left communing with Abraham, and Abraham returned unto his place. Let's look to the Lord in a word of prayer. God, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you for the grace that you bestow on us each and every day. I pray that as we look at your word today that uh, we would see your grace in the life of uh, Abraham, we pray that uh, you would just be with pastor as he preaches, that you would uh, speak through him to us. We pray that you would be with the ladies as they sing. Um, we pray that uh, everything that is said and done today would just uh, bring glory and honor to your name. In your name I pray. Amen.
past my shame. Rising again, I bless your name. You are my all in all. When I fall down, you pick me up. When I am dry, you fill my cup. You are my all in all. Jesus, Lamb of God, worthy is your name. Jesus, Lamb of God, worthy is your name. Jesus, Lamb of God, worthy is your name. Thank you very much, ladies. If you would, please, just keep your Bibles turned there in uh, Genesis, but go back to Genesis chapter number 12. We have been talking for the last few weeks about biblical stewardship, specifically faithful stewardship. Now, stewardship is a biblical principle. What I mean by that, it is a fundamental truth for each born-again, Bible-believing Christian to be responsible for. We are told in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 1, 2, and 10, these words. Let a man so account of us as ministers of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, is required in stewards that a man be found, and if you know it, say it with me, faithful. Okay? God expects us to be faithful stewards as his children. Stewards of the things that he gives us. Goes on to say, as every man hath received the gift, even so minister the same one to another, as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Now, stewardship is defined in Scripture as this, as a, as a house distributor or manager, or an overseer, or an employee uh, uh, of someone. It is a, they are a, a fiscal agent or a treasurer. In other words, a, a steward's duty is to do whatever his master tells him to do. No questions asked. Once proper instruction is given. And God does give us instructions on what to do uh, with our stewardship. A steward is a servant who manages everything for his master, but yet of himself really owns nothing. A steward is first and foremost a servant. That's what we've been talking about. And we've been looking in the life of Abraham. 
Uh, Abraham is, the, is a very good example for us to follow as far as stewardship goes. Now, three weeks ago, uh, we talked about uh, him sending his faithful steward uh, that he had of, of himself, Eleazar, uh, Eleazar, to go and to get a husband, uh, excuse me, a wife for his son. And uh, he's going to be the husband. And the thing that we learned about Eleazar and his stewardship is this is that he was devoted to his master. It's important that we as stewards be devoted to God. God is our master. When we accept Christ our Savior, he becomes our master. Now, we, we don't like that word because we don't like the word servant. But I'm here to tell you, as a child of God, you're God's servant. It's what you are. It's what the Bible calls you. You should own it. You should own it. We're a servant and here, uh, this, this servant Eleazar, he was devoted to his master. He was doing what his master asked him to do. Not only that, but he was determined to follow uh, the Lord. He was determined to follow his master's will. His master told him exactly what he wanted him to do, and he did it to the letter. But not only was he devoted and determined, but he was also dedicated to finishing the task. He didn't stop until he completed what he asked him to do. Then the last couple of weeks, we looked into the life of Abraham and his faithful stewardship. We looked through the examples and we learned that both blessings and trials come uh, uh, to the faithful steward. And if, he, if God owns his heart, then first and foremost, then, then he passes through those things. We are told in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 5 through 7, these words. It says, servants, be obedient to them that are your masters, according to the flesh, with fear and trembling and singleness of heart unto Christ. Not with eye service as man pleasers, but as servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, with good will doing service as, as to the Lord and not unto men. It's important that God has our heart because if God has our heart, then he has us and everything that comes with it. God must first and foremost have our heart. 1 Corinthians 10, 31 tells us this, where, uh, whether therefore ye eat or drink or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. As you look into the life of Abraham, Abraham's life taught us that a faithful steward gives himself totally to his master. And that's what we learned the past couple of weeks, especially last week as we talked about when God asked him to bring his son to a certain place and to sacrifice him there. Now, he, 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 he did not follow through because God had stopped him. But in his heart and in his mind, he had followed through in doing that. Now, in our scripture reading this morning, we are going to uh, read about a man who was in some deep spiritual trouble. His name is Lot. I had, I had Robert read chapter 18 because I wanted you to see the love that an uncle had for his nephew. But as you look at, at, uh, uh, at chapter number 19, turn there real quick. We'll go back to Genesis chapter 12. Lot was in trouble. The Bible tells us this. And there came two angels to Sodom uh, at Eve. And Lot sat in, uh, sat in the gate of Sodom. Lot, seeing them, rose and, uh, up to meet them and bowed himself with his face to the ground. And he said... Behold now, my lords, turn in, I pray you, into your servant's house and tarry all night and wash your feet and ye shall rise up early and go your way. And they, uh, and they said, Nay, but we will abide in the street all night. And he pressed upon them greatly uh, and they turned in unto him and they entered into the house and he made them a feast and he did bake unleavened bread and they did eat. But before they laid down, the men of the city, even the men of Sodom, compressed the house round uh, both old and young and all the people from every quarter. And they called to Lot and said unto him, where are the men which came into thee this night? Bring them unto us that we may know them. And Lot went out the door unto them and shut the door after him. And he said, I pray you, brethren, do not so wickedly, Behold, now I have two daughters which have not known man. Let them, I pray you, let, let me, I pray you, bring them out unto you and do ye to them as is good in your eyes. Only to these men do nothing um, for therefore they came under the shadow of my roof. Now when you listen to that story and you think about what he was saying and where he was sitting and what he was doing, something was wrong with Lot. 
Because when you study about Abraham's life, you automatically learn about Lot. Lot was a blessed man by God, but Lot had wasted God's blessings. Let's look at his life. Go back to chapter number 12. Lot was a blessed man. He was blessed because uh, he was with his uncle Abraham. In verses 1 through 4 of chapter 12, we have the call of God to Abraham. And God calls him out of the Earl of the Chaldees. And God is calling him uh, into a land uh, that, uh, that he has never been to. And it's going to be a land of promise for him. And the Bible tells us in chapter, uh, in verse number four, so Abraham departed as the Lord had spoken unto him and Lot went with him. Lot went with him, his nephew. Lot, uh, who was Lot? He was the nephew of Abraham. We are told in, 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 uh, in the book, who's who and where's where in the Bible, these words about Lot. It said, Lot was the son of Haran, Abraham's youngest brother. Haran died as a young man while, uh, while Abraham's extended family, led by their father Terah, uh, still living in Ur, a thriving city on the Euphrates River, is now, uh, which is now uh, southern Iraq. Abraham apparently took Lot under his wing, a good match since Lot had no father and Abraham and Sarah had no children. He was brought into uh, Abraham's family. And when God called him to go into this land, Lot went with him. And, uh, and Abraham was already 75 years old. And he took his wife and he took Lot. He was allowed to accompany him to go into the promised land. Why was he blessed? Well, uh, he was trained to serve the Lord under Uncle Abraham. Look at verse number five. And Abram took Sarah, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, and all their substance, and they gathered uh, and had gathered the souls, uh, excuse me, that they had gathered and the souls that they had gotten in Haran. And they went forth into Canaan, into the land of Canaan they came. And Abraham passed through the land to a place of Shechem, to the plain of uh, Mori, Mora, excuse me. And the Canaanites was in the land. And the Lord appeared to Abram and said, Unto thee, uh, excuse me, unto thy seed will I give this land. And there built he an altar unto the Lord and worshiped him. And he moved from thence to a mountain in, uh, east of Bethel, and he pitched his tent, having Bethel on the west and Ai on the uh, east. And there he built an altar unto the Lord and called upon the name of the Lord. He had watched his uncle serve God. The scripture tell us, tells us that Abraham, everywhere he went, he built an altar. And I believe that, that as he built this altar, that he wasn't just worshiping himself, but he was bringing his family into the worship of this God that he was following. And they learned to serve God. I believe Lot learned from his uncle how to love and to fear the Lord. The Bible tells us that Lot was a just and righteous man. In 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 7 and 8, tells us this. And delivered a just Lot, vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked, talking about being in Sodom, for, for that righteous man dwelling among them, seeing and hearing, vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. Now, the words used here in the Bible, uh, just and righteous, both come from, from the same word, which means fair and just. In other words, in his character, uh, at one time, Lot was a righteous person. He was someone who knew the Lord. He knew better. He had been blessed by God. He had seen God work through his uncle. He had received some of the blessings of God. Uh, Abraham, the, the Bible tells us, uh, what was, was very rich and wealthy. God kept blessing him. He followed his uncle, and his uncle was blessed, and he too received those blessings. Look at verse number 13. Uh, excuse me, chapter 13, verses 1 through 5. It says, And Abraham went up out of Egypt, he and his wife, and all that he had, and Lot with him. There again, Lot is with him into the south. And Abraham was rich in cattle and silver and gold. And he journeyed, and he went on his journeys to the south, even to uh, Bethel, unto the place uh, where his tent had been before, between Bethel and, and Hai, and <clears throat> unto the uh, place of the altar, which he had made there at the first. And Abraham called upon the name of the Lord. And Lot also, which was with him, had flocks and herds and tents. Because of his uncle, because of the business or whatever uh, they were in, uh, uh, into, Lot and his family were being blessed. They were receiving the blessings of God uh, uh, as, as long as they were with uh, um, uh, Abraham. And God was blessing them in that. But the thing that we see about Lot here in chapter 13 is that Lot isn't satisfied 
with just the blessings of God. He was a man whose eyes began to control his heart. Oh, that song that we learned to sing as, as little kids in Sunday school. Oh, be careful, little eyes, what you see. For the Father up above is looking down in love. Oh, be careful, little eyes, what you see. And you'd think, well, that's just a little kid's song. No, it's not just a little kid's song. Boy, our eyes get us in trouble, don't they? Our eyes get us in trouble. They really do. My wife and I, we went out to, to dinner the other day, and she said, hey. She goes, I think the last time that we were here, we shared this together. And I said, well, I don't think there's enough for us to share. I think I, you get your own, and I'll get my own. When my plate came, I was like, oh, yeah, I forgot how big all this stuff was. <laughs> so I started eating it. I finally got to the point to where I just pushed my plate away and said, I'm done. And she said, are we still getting cheesecake? We were at the Cheesecake Factory. Thank you, whoever gave us the card. It was a great blessing. And uh, in that... And, uh, and yes, I ate my cheesecake, but not till 11.30 at night. Did I pay for it? Absolutely. And uh, in that. But sometimes our eyes get us in trouble. Our eyes are bigger than our stomach, but sometimes our eyes get us in trouble because we're looking at things that we should not be looking at. And here in Lot's life, he had been, he had been blessed. But there was a problem that had arose. Look at verses uh, 6 of chapter 13. And the land was not able to bear them, both uh, Abraham's wealth and Lot's wealth. Uh, and they had too many flocks, too many herds. Uh, for their, uh, the Bible says uh, they might dwell together for their substance was great and uh, that they could not dwell together. And there was strife between the herdsmen of Abraham's cattle and the herdsmen of Lot's cattle. And uh, the Canaanites and the uh, uh, Perizzite um, uh, dwelt in the land. And Abraham said unto Lot, let there not be no strife, I pray thee, between me and thee and between thy, my herdsmen and thy herdsmen, for we be brethren. Is not the whole land before thee? Separate thyself, I pray thee, from me. If thou wilt take the left hand, then I will go to the right. Or if thou wilt depart to the right hand, I will go to the left. And verse number 10 says, And Lot lifted up his eyes and beheld the plain of Jordan, that it was uh, uh, well watered everywhere before the Lord had destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, even uh, as the garden of the Lord, like uh, the land of Egypt, as it cometh to Zoar. And Lot chose him all the plain of Jordan, and Lot journeyed east, and they, and they separated themselves one from another. And Abraham dwelt in the land of Canaan, and Lot dwelt in the cities of the plain, and pitched his tent toward Sodom. Verse number 13 tells us, but the, but the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. A problem arose. So a proposal was given by his uncle. Lot should have, even in, especially in, the, in that culture, should have just separated himself long before this time. But his uncle, being gracious as he was, gave him first choice. But he was pre predestined for a fall. His eyes predetermined his choice. He looked at the land and he said it was like Egypt, even as it cometh to Zor. Now, on the surface, it seems like a very logical place. If you have cattle and you have herds, if you're a rancher or a herdsman, uh, you want a place that's well watered. You want a place that, that, uh, uh, that you can uh, feed your, your cattle in. Passion and selfishness, though, sometimes or a lot of times make men rude. Lot looked at the goodness of the land, therefore he doubted uh, not uh, that such fruitful soil would be a great place for it to go. But where, uh, but what came of it? Those uh, who, in choosing relationships, callings, dwelling, settlements, are guided and governed by the lust of their flesh and lust of their eyes and the pride of life cannot expect God to bless them. The Bible tells us, yes, it looked good that way, but there was an exceeding wicked people that lived that way. And the Bible tells us that he pitched his tent towards Sodom. In other words, he had his, his tent doors open towards that way, moving slowly towards sin. You know what? Most of us don't dive in to sin. People that become alcoholics don't become alcoholics overnight. People that become addicted to drugs don't become addicted to drugs overnight. Pornography, just fill in the blank, doesn't usually happen overnight. And him wasting his blessings didn't happen overnight. The Bible tells us and it warns us in 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 through 17. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. For if any man loved the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, is not of the Father, but of the world. And the world passeth away in the lust thereof. 
But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. His eyes blinded his heart from the spiritual danger of the choice that he was making. He made his choice and it wasn't long before he was within the domain of Sodom and Glamorah. How do we know that? Because in chapter 14, he becomes captured when their city was overtaken and his uncle has to go and rescue him. You would think after seeing what had taken place that maybe God was sending a warning shot across the bow, letting him know, hey, you're headed for danger. You need to look up. You need to do what's right. And a lot of times God will send warnings our way. But a lot of times we just don't look at them. A lot didn't change overnight. It was slowly but surely. But we can see here Lot was a man who wasted the blessings of God. Go back to chapter number 19 and this is where we'll spend the rest of our time. Here in chapter number 19 is one of the saddest stories that could ever be preached. It's a sad story. You see, we see a man who lost God's blessings for a position. The city gate was a meeting place for city officials and other men to discuss current events or transact business. It is a place of authority. It is a place of status where one uh, could be seen or could see. Evidently, Lot held a special position there. He was in the city gates. He was in this place that God was getting ready to destroy that the Bible tells in the New Testament vexed his righteous soul, but yet he was still there. He turned over the blessings of God so that he could have a position, so that he could be seen, so that he could feel important. Sitting in the city gate was a very dangerous thing, which meant that you were in agreement with what was going on within that city. It was dangerous. We see a man that had no testimony with his friends. As these, as these angels came in, Lot knew Hey, you don't want to abide in this city. You don't want to be out on the streets at night. Things that go on here, the debauchery, all of that stuff, you don't want to do that. That's why the Bible tells us that he pressed sore to bring them in to his house. But not only did was Lot lost his blessings for a position, but he was a man that lost his testimony among his friends. These people that he called his friends came <laughs> banging on his door. I don't want to get graphic, but they weren't there to greet those people with a plate of brownies. They weren't the welcome wagon. They were a bunch of men that wanted to have relations with these men. They were wrong. They were wicked. They were evil. There's no two ways about it. And they were banging on his door saying, hey, bring those men out that we may know them. Probably the sickest thing I've ever heard was his response. He had no testimony among his friends, but he lost his testimony among his family. Now God blessed me with two precious girls. I love Crystal and I love Stacia with all of my heart. And that little Ava Grace, she owns me. She owns me. I couldn't imagine going out and telling these wicked men, hey, I have two daughters that have never known a man. Have your way with them. Just don't touch these guys that are in here. How depraved do you have to be? He'd say, surely that didn't happen. Well, the word of God says that it did. And that's what he was willing to do. He was willing to sacrifice his family. This was somebody who had the blessings of God at one time on his family. He knew who the Lord was. He knew what it was to worship the Lord. Let's put it in perspective today. He took his family to church. He ensured that his kids were in a good youth group. He made sure that things were going well with them. But pretty soon, other things became more important, position. His testimony wasn't import, as, as important anymore because he really didn't have a testimony with, with these guys. They said, hey, uh, as a matter of fact, let's just look at it. Uh, uh, look at verse number nine. And they said, stand back. Uh, and they said again, this one fellow came into sojourn 
uh, and he will needs be a judge. Now we will deal worse with thee than with them. I said, hey, you think you're somebody? You're nobody to us. You're nobody. That's what the world does. Just chews people up and spits them out. He was nobody to them. They were getting ready to do to him what they were going to do to those angels, to those other men. They were going to deal worse with him. It wasn't for God's intervention here at the end of verse 9. And they pressed uh, sore upon the man, even Lot. And they came near to break the door. But, verse 10, the men put forth their hands and pulled Lot into the house and shut the door. He used his family as bargaining chips. He had no respect from his family. As he gets pulled back in, it says this. It says, but the men pulled... uh, pulled them forth and they shut the door. Verse number 11. And they smote the men that were at the door of the house with blindness. And both small and great. So that they wearied themselves to find the door. Now think about it. Excuse me. Sorry. I something got in my mouth that just wouldn't come out. And it, but here they wearied themselves. Think about it. They wearied themselves to find the door. They weren't given up. They weren't given up. That's how wicked this place was. Is it any wonder why we're told that it vexed, that you just bothered him? I mean, can, can I just ask you, church, do things on the news bother you? Do they upset you? What are you doing about it? What are you doing about it? We had a paper that we asked people to look at and read. How many of you have contacted your legislators? Don't raise your hands. How many of you have done something about it? I mean, really? You read about it. We talk about it. We get upset about it. But what do we do about it? This is, what, this is the result of not doing anything about it. Verse number 12. And the men said unto Lot, Hast thou any besides son-in-law? And thy sons, thy daughters, and whosoever thou hast in the city, bring them out of this place. For we will destroy this place because the cry of them has waxed great before the face of the Lord. And the Lord has sent us to destroy it. And Lot went out and spake to his sons-in-law, which married his daughters, and said, Up, get you out of this place, for the Lord shall destroy this city. But it seemed as one that mocked unto his sons-in-law. They thought, what? You're talking about God to us? Now? We've seen your testimony. It's baloney and we don't believe it. That'd be some hard words to hear. Be some hard words to hear. He's warning them of what's taking place and they're just laughing. Saying, yeah, right. You know the Lord? He completely lost his testimony. Why? Position was more important. Getting along with those other people were more important. Look at verse 15. And when the morning arose, the angels uh, hastened Lot, saying, Arise, get thy wife and thy two daughters, which are here, lest thou be consumed with the iniquity of the city. I want you, I want everybody to read verse 16, the first four verses with verse 16 with me. Ready? And while he lingered, excuse me, I have angels of God that just rescued me the night before, that warned me that they were there to destroy the city. They're already hastening me to get out the door and warning me to get out of the city to flee. And what am I doing? Lingering? Lingering? I'd be like Brother John running into a burning fire, getting people out. And some guy said, well, I'm, I've got to get these couple of things here. Brother John's going to grab that guy by the nap of the neck and drag him out the door. Why? He's a fireman. There's danger. It's his job. But here he was lingering. He was taking his time to get out. Why? Because he didn't want to leave. 
He didn't want to leave. I don't think he believed it himself. But yet, he had a praying uncle. When his uncle intervened, and he knew Lot, he thought, surely by now, Lot's probably, you know, they've got a church going. There's probably a a small church of 50 people. If there's 50 righteous people in the city, I'll just ask God. But I think as Lot started, or as Abraham started thinking about Lot and his recent testimony, he went from 50 to 10. If God was to come knocking on your door, I'm going to destroy your household. Could you find 10 righteous people in your family? Have you ever thought about that? Something I dwelt on this week. Are there 10 righteous people within my family? If not, why not? Now, I I know people make choices on their own, but I want to make sure that my testimony is leading people to Christ and not away from. That's what's so important for us. He had a praying uncle, but while he lingered, let's go on. And the men laid hold upon his hand and upon uh, the hand of his wife and upon the hand of his two daughters and the Lord being merciful unto him and they brought him forth and set him without the city. And it came to pass that when they brought them forth abroad and that he said escape for thy life this is the angel talking to lot look not behind thee neither stay thou in all the plain get out of the plain we're destroying everything here escape to the mountain lest thou be consumed and lot said unto them oh not so my lord what he's already drug him out of the city He's already put him outside and now he says, get to the mountains. That's where you'll find safety. This is where you need to be. No, I don't want to go there. God was a whole lot more patient than I would have been. He starts bargaining. Behold now, thy servant hath found grace in thy sight, which he already had. And thou hath magnified thy mercy, which, which thou hast shown unto me in saving my life. I cannot escape to the mountain, lest some evil take me and I die. Behold now, this city is near to flee unto. It is a little one. Oh, let me escape thither. It is a little one that my soul shall live. He didn't want to get completely out of sin. He said, I'll just go to the next city. Just let me go to the next city. He gave him an escape plan. God was merciful. And he said unto him, See, I have accepted uh, thee concerning this thing also, that I will not overthrow this city which for which thou hast spoken. Hasten thee, escape thither, for I cannot do anything till thou come hither. Therefore, the name of the city was Zoar. He was a man that lingered when he was told to flee. He was a man who only wanted to get out just outside the world. But he was a man that wasted and lost all of God's blessings in the world. Look down at at verse number 26. God rains down fire and brimstone upon Sodom and Gomorrah, the cities of the plain, except for the one where Lot went to. Verse number 26 But his wife looked back behind him and she became a pillar of salt. He lost his wife because he lingered and because he bartered. I think he lost her long before then because she got used to the city and she wanted to look back at what she was losing. You know, when God saved us from sin, we don't need to look back, we need to go forward. We don't need to retreat. We need to go forward. He lost his wealth. And Abraham got up early, if you would please, uh, verse 27, in the morning to the place where he stood before the Lord. And he looked unto Sodom and Gomorrah toward all the land of the plain and beheld, and lo, the smoke of the country went up as the smoke of a furnace. He lost everything that he had. Remember, he he had great possessions. 
He had cattle and herds. He had all those things and everything that God had blessed him with because he wasted his life, he lost it all in one fell swoop. It was all burned up. It was all gone. I like verse 29. And it came to pass that when God destroyed the cities of the plain, that God remembered Abraham and sent Lot out of the midst of the overthrow. For when uh, he overthrew the cities, uh, which were, uh, were over through the cities in which Lot dwelt. He had a praying uncle. His uncle prayed for him. And because he had a praying uncle, God showed mercy. Why? Because his uncle was a faithful steward. He asked of God for a blessing. If you're here this morning and you have a praying family member for you, don't discount that. It's important to have friends. It's important to have family members that pray for us. And you would think that, you know, that's got to be the end of the story, Brother Rick. No, it gets worse. It gets worse. Because Lot had already lost all of his married children. He had lost his wife. He had two daughters. Because of time, I'll let you read it yourself, but just let me tell you what happens. He flees the city that he was in, goes up into the mountains, is in a cave. And his daughters come up with a scheme saying, you know what, no men will ever touch us. There's no men left for us. Let's make our father drunk so that we may have children by him. And on two separate nights, each daughter becomes pregnant by their father. You talk about a man that it was destroyed. Other than in the New Testament, you don't ever hear about Lot anymore. He totally wasted everything that he had. And by the way, those two illegitimate sons went on to become Israel's greatest enemies, the Moabites and the Amorites. Sin always has consequences. In Genesis chapter 18, verses 16 through 30, we read how God told Abraham that he was going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. Instantly, instantly, Abraham started asking God to grant grace. He loved his nephew and his family. He probably knew Lot was living in sin, but didn't want, uh, but still wanted God's grace and mercy to be bestowed upon him. He asked for and received mercy for Lot. The only catch was that Lot and nine others had to be righteous before God. Yes, just 10. But it was not so. Lot wasted God's blessings and lost his family and his possessions. We read, we read the only reason that Lot and his daughters were spared was because their uncle Abraham intervened on their behalf in verse 29. But as we have seen, this too, they wasted their second chance in sin. Can I tell you that a faithful steward must realize that the blessings that he receives from God are to be used for God's glory? You think about the blessings that God has bestowed upon you. As I sit in my house, as I drive my cars, as I look at the things that God has given me, the family that he has blessed me with, I can't help but to say that I have showers of blessings. They are all God-given. You come to my house, you sit at my table, I could start pointing at how God blessed us and to be able to have this, that, and the other. It was God's blessings. I recognize that. I must use them as a good steward for him. A faithful steward must realize that the blessings that he receives from God are to be used for God's glory. 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 10 and 11 say this. As every man hath received the gift, even so minister the same one to another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. If any man speak, let him speak of the oracles of God. If any man minister, let him do it as the ability which God giveth. 
that God in all things may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom be praise and dominion forever and ever. All of our time, all of our talents, all of our treasure, all of our testimonies belong to God because they came from God. We have no right to use them in any way outside of God's will. God forbid that we should be an unjust steward with the manifold grace that, of God that God has given to us. Don't waste it. Be a faithful steward. Lot's life ended up being a waste. I'd rather be an Abraham. Abraham made mistakes. He was not perfect. But he came back to God. And what is he known as in the Bible? As a friend of God. I want to be God's friend. I want to have an Abraham testimony, not a Lot testimony. How about you? Let's stand together with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, please. This morning as we, we think about the things that God has given us, uh, this, this story, it's a, it's a tough one to preach. Get no joy out of it. But you know what? It's in the Bible. And I believe that it's put there for a reason to warn us. You know what? God gives us lots of blessings. Let's make sure that we don't waste them. One of those blessings is salvation. Maybe you're here this morning and you don't know Christ as your Lord and personal Savior. There are men and women up here who have the word of God that can show you how you can have a relationship with God, how you can come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. This morning, if you don't know Christ, your Lord and personal Savior, why not step out? Many of you have been here time and time again. Maybe you don't know him. Let them introduce you to him. But if you are here and you are saved, are you devoted? Are you determined? Are you dedicated in being a faithful steward to God? Stewardship is much more than money. Money's important, I understand that. But unless he has our heart and unless he has our all, he'll never have anything else of ours. This morning, whatever your need is, why don't you come? Father, we thank you, Lord, for your love and goodness to us, your mercy, your grace. Lord, just be with us and during this time of invitation, if we ask this in your precious name, amen.